Hello, once again, my fellow followers of Adam, and welcome to any non-believers that may have wandered in. I am Rad King, and today's sermon, I finished the attempt to cover all unarmed weapons. I already did one video, and this follow-up has some awesome fan favorites that need to be given their dues. Let's learn more about Adam's creations together by going over the lore, possible real-world inspirations, and interesting tidbits about some of the most underappreciated weapons in the whole series. So, crank up the rads, and be glad for the unarmed weapons of Fallout. I also have a comment highlight section at the end where I go over some top comments from previous videos and react to them, whether they are correcting a mistake I've made, give good information, or have just made me laugh. You can have a chance of being featured yourself by leaving a comment. So let's begin. The first weapon on this list comes from the deadliest part of a Deathclaw and turns it into a usable weapon. I hope you were thinking about its hands, because I sure was. Because it's used to make the Deathclaw Gauntlet, which was first featured in Fallout 3 and seen in every game to come after. In Fallout 3, it is one of the several craftable weapons that can only be assembled when the player recovers the schematics, and has to be crafted by the player using a Deathclaw hand, a medical brace, a leather belt, and wonder glue. This weapon is the strongest unarmed weapon in terms of raw damage but it gets even better. It ignores the damage resistance of all armors, slicing right through and nullifying any effect the armor has. We still aren't done though, because in addition to all of that, it has a times five critical hit multiplier that can make this weapon just so dangerous. If you dump a lot of points into luck and get the ninja perk, you will constantly be getting criticals, really upping your damage output. It is pretty durable, lasting for 600 hits from full condition. The homemade nature of the weapon is driven home by the appearance, which simply looks like a deathclaw hand with a belt and brace to allow for someone to attach it to their forearm and cosplay as a giant death lizard. The skin and claws are perfectly preserved, which would suggest at least some level of taxidermy has occurred, or maybe just tanning of the hide. The medical brace allows the hand to attach to the forearm, while the belt is gripped by the hand, although there also appears to be a bunch of bolts driven into the Deathclaw hand as well. This weapon is riddled with oddities, however, like how the Deathclaw hand that is used by the player is significantly smaller than the hands found on any Deathclaw. The skin color is also different, but maybe these changes could be attributed to a treatment of the hide. There is also evidence that this was meant to be a melee weapon at some point, since it is set to a melee weapon equip type, which means it uses the same sound as melee weapons when equipped. Or maybe the developers just really wanted this weapon to have a different sound from the other unarmed weapons. Three schematics can be obtained, one by completing the quest Council Seat in favor of Bannon at River City, one in a trailer in the F. Scott Key Trail and Campground area, and lastly, one in a random encounter where a Wastelander is being stalked by a wounded Deathclaw, where the schematics are found on the Wastelander's body. The only fully assembled example is found in the Pit DLC, on the body of John Bear after defeating him in the Gladiator Battles of the Hole. The Gauntlet, as it is portrayed in Fallout 3, also exists in Fallout New Vegas, although it is cut content. There are technically two unique versions, however, but only one is accessible if you don't have the Wild Wasteland trait. Since the weapon went unused in the base form, it has identical stats to the Fallout 3 weapon, but the uniquely named Fist of Rar is another story. Introduced with the Lonesome Road add-on, the Fist of Rar is a craftable version of the Gauntlet, just like in Fallout 3. There are a number of prerequisites, however, as one must first defeat the unique Deathclaw named Rar in the Divide, loot the Talon of Rar off his body, and have an unarmed skill of 75 or higher to craft it. The Fist of Rar has higher damage, DPS, and critical damage with a slower swing speed, when compared to the cut base version that is in the files but found nowhere in game. It gets a bonus critical chance, bonus critical damage, and a times 2 bonus to limb damage. It has lower durability, only striking 445 times from full condition. Although Rar is a dark green color, the Fist of Rar is the normal Deathclaw skin color. 
and even though the Talon of Rar is described as being larger than normal, the Gauntlet is the same size as in Fallout 3. If you have the Wild Wasteland perk, rather than crafting the Fist of Rar, you craft the North Fist of Rar, which is identical in every way, except for the name of course, which is a reference to the Fist of the North Star manga. If you love the Deathclaw Gauntlet, then hold on to the Fist of Rar, because it is the only Deathclaw Gauntlet that you can get in all of New Vegas. Like many in-game objects, the Deathclaw Gauntlet got a redesign in Fallout 4. No longer do we have the entire hand, skin and all, we now have some finger bones that are held together with bolts, wire clamps, and a metal bar. The user puts their arm through a circular padded brace and grips the metal bar between the two large claw and hand bones. The weapon is still one of the best unarmed options with top tier damage and DPS. It can accept one modification, the extra claw upgrade, which will do just that. Add a third claw that goes above the player's arm and increases damage. With this mod, it barely loses out to the puncturing power fist, but it gets an additional 25% chance to disarm an opponent. What kind of disarming? All of them. Even though the power fist can out damage the gauntlet, the gauntlet requires the most AP and vats needing a whopping 40 points per hit. Unlike earlier games, it cannot be crafted from scratch, and will start to be sold by merchants after level 20. Additionally, one can be found near the Deathclaw Nest during the Devil's Due quest, which I did not know until now, despite doing the quest multiple times. The gauntlet is much more appropriately sized now when compared to the actual Deathclaw hand sizes, but it is interesting to note that Deathclaws in Fallout 4 seem to have shorter, but more robust claws. Whereas Fallout 3 and New Vegas have longer and thinner claws, it is also worth noting that the gauntlet cannot be equipped with power armor since the player's hand has to slide into the brace. The gauntlet shows up in Fallout 76 in the same form as Fallout 4, with the same single mod and similar high damage. Unlike in Fallout 4, however, the player can craft it after getting the plan. Needing adhesive, plastic, rubber, springs, steel, a deathclaw hand, and some screws. There is one unique variant called the Unstoppable Monster, which is available as a plan from Daily Ops. It is a 3-star legendary that combines the Bloodied Perk, which increases damage when the player has low health, a major modifier that increases the power attack damage by 40%, and a minor modifier that causes the player to take 40% less damage while executing a power attack. The base gauntlet can be found randomly spawned in a few places, but can be consistently found on a table in the Sons of Dane compound. I wish there were more modification options in the latter fallouts for this weapon. Being able to poison people with poison dipped claws or adding electrical damage with some impromptu wires and a battery would be really cool. Fallout New Vegas has the most unarmed weapon options of any game, which is unsurprising, and one unique unarmed weapon that is not seen anywhere else is the Displacer Glove. This very peculiar looking weapon has some bright lights on the large portion mounted to the forearm with an almost speaker looking component that sits on the player's knuckles. Although a small energy cell can be seen nested in the top, the weapon does not consume any ammunition due to engine limitations. Upon striking an enemy, there is a large blue-white force field-like explosion, not too dissimilar to that seen with the Gauss rifle and this seems to be the displacement field that the glove is named after as it produces a large knockback effect. This field amplifies the player's strike, although it is not clear how the user themselves are protected from this, and it does a great deal of damage. At 50 damage per strike, it is similar to the Power Fist variants, with a fairly quick swing speed giving it solid DPS, but the critical multiplier is effectively non-existent at times one. There is one unique variant with a different color scheme called Pushy, and this is a nice weapon. Boosting the damage and swing speed, it has the second highest DPS of any unarmed weapon in the game, being beat out only by the industrial hand. It is found on the body of a dead Jackal gang member in the Ruby Hill Mine, although how such an advanced piece of tech fell into their hands is unknown. Likewise, we just don't know anything about the background of this weapon. It is unique in form and function, and is obviously cutting edge tech, and it would honestly not surprise me if it were made by Big Mountain, although there's just no information about the background of this weapon. 
Fallout Tactics is the next game with the most unarmed options, and the Razor Claws are a pretty ridiculous example of that. A passing glance makes it obvious that this is inspired by Wolverine's claws, and if this was ever in doubt, just look at the concept art. With an X-Men X on the hand, and the mention of adamantium claws, this seems less like inspiration and more like just a straight up easter egg. The weapon description even informs us that they are extendable claws, and looking at the model it appears that a portion on the forearm is where the claws retract to. It does a good amount of damage, with base damage between 6 and 24, and is found only in the area of Marden. How exactly these very long razor claws are supposed to retract is rather mysterious, because the claws are much longer than the entire length of the glove. Now, many of you in the first video asked where the only true unarmed weapons, for lack of a better term, are, and here you go. Fallout 2 is the only game that actually makes this quite straightforward. So let's start there, rather than in the first Fallout like I normally do. In Fallout 2, the player has a number of unarmed attacks, the most basic of which are a simple punch or kick. As your unarmed skill increases, your character moves from basic attacks to more advanced ones, like a haymaker or a hook kick. The character will always have a primary and secondary punch and primary and secondary kick, which don't seem to have too much of a difference. However, as you get more powerful punches and kicks, your critical chance can increase and your attacks can become armor piercing, while also requiring a lot more AP. I could go through all the options and the requirements needed, but it would get pretty boring if I launch into all that. So here are some brief examples to just give you a good idea. The simplest attack, a punch or kick, are primary attacks and take no skills or special stats to execute, doing pretty pitiful damage based on this equation that usually lands around 1 or 2 damage requiring 3 AP. As your unarmed skill increases, you need to level up agility and strength, as well as meet character level requirements to unlock stronger attacks with more effects. For example, the critical chance can go as high as plus 50% and damage of plus 12 while bypassing some armor as well. It really takes a very specialized build to make a truly unarmed playthrough viable, since you don't get the extra damage and benefits of using unarmed weapons. The first Fallout uses a slightly different formula for determining your base unarmed damage, which will be the damage output for unarmed punches and kicks, and Tactics uses the same formula as Fallout 2. The first three Fallout games that I just mentioned can benefit from a number of perks and skills, like the bonus hand-to-hand -hand damage, which gives you plus 2 damage, bonus hand-to-hand -hand attacks, which reduces AP by 1, Slayer, which causes all hand-to-hand -hand attacks to cause critical hits, and Silent Death, which will cause double damage for hand-to-hand -hand attacks while sneaking and striking the target's back. These perks will be imperative for anyone trying to make a viable hand-to-hand -hand build in the early games. Unsurprisingly, Fallout 3 changes a lot of things, starting with the formula, but also reduces the effects and number of hand-to-hand -hand attacks. The ultimate damage output is still pretty pathetic, with fewer perks to make the build viable, which are Iron Fist, which increases unarmed damage by 5 for each time the perk is chosen, but maxes out at 15. Paralyzing Palm will help with Vats, offering a 30% chance to paralyze the target for 30 seconds, which can be useful, but 30% is still pretty low. One strange quirk is that melee and unarmed attacks in Vats do twice as much damage than outside of Vats, for whatever reason, and you are able to do a more powerful attack while sneaking. Fallout 4 ditches skills in general, so there is no unarmed skill anymore. However, the Iron Fist perk can increase unarmed punching attacks by 100% and causes paralysis on critical strikes. Ninja can also increase your melee sneak attacks by times 10. And ultimately, there are a number of other perks that can make a hand-to-hand -hand build work. Fallout 76 has more perks than Fallout 4 as perk cards, meaning that there are a lot of ways to make a hand-to-hand -hand build work like Iron Fist, which increases damage, or Incisor, that causes you to bypass a target's armor. This isn't a build video though. Suffice it to say that unarmed attacks are some of the most complicated, as it is based on fundamental mechanics that differ game to game. It would be very satisfying if we were able to get more true unarmed options in new games, like for instance allowing for kicks rather than just punches. 
Fallout 76 gives us a very musical way to pummel enemies, and that comes to us in the form of the Death Tambo. It is easily recognizable as a tambourine, but has been modified to have a large grip and spikes on the outside of the tambourine. Naturally, every time one strikes with the weapon, it rings out just like a tambourine would, and does respectable but not particularly great damage. It can be crafted and accepts one modification, that is a paint scheme that can be bought in the Atom Store called Sleigh Bells, that is S-L-A-Y, and makes it look very festive. It can be crafted when the plan is found or given to the player after completing Rose's quests at the top of the world. There is one variant known as Tone Death, which is more colorful and has sharper looking spikes, but has some useful legendary effects. It can be rewarded after completing the event Eviction Notice, and has a 40% faster swing speed, reduces the target's damage output by 25%, and increases strength by 1 when equipped. That means you can bump up your carry weight by 5 pounds just by equipping the weapon, and since it only weighs 0.3 pounds itself, you can just keep it around in your inventory and equip it if you accidentally creep above your max carry limit. Fallout Tactics has a weapon simply known as Sappers, which are black, tactical-looking gloves that looks like it has padding on the knuckles, fingers, and back of the palm, but is actually packed with lead to make punches more damaging. Sap gloves are a fairly common weapon used by security personnel, as they can be rather unassuming, but can both protect the user's hands during hand-to-hand -hand combat, while also making punches more damaging to targets. In the game, the damage is pretty tame, between 4 and 6 damage, and can be found in the Peoria area. Let's tackle a weapon that has been featured in every single Fallout game to date, with Fallout Brotherhood of Steel being the sole exception. There are only a select few number of weapons that carry such an honor, and fewer still that are unarmed weapons. Brass Knuckles is one such weapon, and in the first Fallout are said to be made of steel, doing 2 to 5 base damage. The player can start the game with a pair if the unarmed skill is tagged and is otherwise rather unassuming looking and easily identifiable. It is portrayed the same in Fallout 2, with the same stats, and since it is an entry level weapon, they are easily found on the bodies of raiders and sold by merchants. Fallout Tactics puts some small spikes on the brass knuckles, but otherwise they do the same damage as the first two Fallouts. Fallout 3 once again shows this low level weapon, doing base 6 damage with no other real benefits other than just being pretty durable, striking 667 times before breaking. There is a cut variant called Love Tap that would have upped the critical damage and critical multiplier, while reducing overall AP cost, making it a good weapon. The pit introduces steel knuckles, which look exactly like brass knuckles, but they do a bit more damage and reduce AP cost by 4 action points, making it more useful in VATS. It also doubles in durability, striking 1111 times, and is given to the player after returning 30 steel ingots to Everett. And that whole quest of arming a slave has always kind of been hilarious to me. Fallout New Vegas has the brass knuckles in the same exact form, but with a strength requirement of 2 now, and an increased damage at 18 per hit. It is very durable, and can be concealed when going into casinos, where security is often armed with these very weapons. Fallout 4 gives us the brass knuckles with some different characteristics, only doing 10 damage, and having a medium swing speed for whatever reason, it can be upgraded with sharp, spiked, puncturing, or bladed mods which increases overall damage, can pierce armor, or cause bleeding damage. The bleeding effect is very strong in Fallout 4, and easily stacks, so that would be absolutely worth it. Fallout 76 has the knuckles in the same exact form as in Fallout 4, doing low damage, and has all the same modifications. So the ability to turn brass knuckles into bladed or spiked variants leads me to the other variant that is found in all the games, Spiked Knuckles. Spiked Knuckles are first seen in the first Fallout, boosting damage up to 10 per strike. They are less common than the Brass Knuckles, but can be found sold by the Gunrunners, carried by Kane, or on Super Mutants. Once again, they are exactly the same in Fallout 2, but can be found in more places, including the Dunton Brothers in Klamath, who will always spawn a new one if theirs gets pickpocketed. Spiked Knuckles are very common in the Capital Wasteland, and do a bit more damage and critical damage, but are otherwise the same as Brass Knuckles. 
A unique variant called Plunkett's Valid Points boosts damage and critical damage once again, but also getting a times two critical chance. It can only be obtained from Junder's Plunkett, a raider who has holed up in Arlington House awaiting the regulators who are coming to get him as they have offed the rest of his raider friends. Due to this, you need to have the Lawbringer perk to have Junders, and therefore his Spiked Knuckles, spawn in game. Spiked Knuckles in New Vegas boosts the damage and is easily found on the bodies of enemies. There is an awesome unique variant though, known as Love and Hate, that just look fantastic and have quite good stats. Doing higher damage and critical damage, they can also strike for an impressive 1,495 times from full condition. As the name implies, the words love and hate are engraved on the knuckles with bloodied spikes, which is a reference to the movie The Night of the Hunter, where a character named Robert Mitchum has those words tattooed on his fists. Fallout 4 and 76 have the option to modify the brass knuckles with spikes or blades as mentioned before, and these modifications seem to have taken the place of the dedicated spiked knuckles weapon that we can find in all previous games. Hey, let's take some time and look at two entries from the game that best represents the entire series, Fallout Brotherhood of Steel. Oh yeah. Ripper gloves are the second most powerful of all unarmed weapons. They appear to be just some sort of armored and spiked gauntlet. However, the description lets us know that it is actually equipped with drill-like motors that allow the user to bore these spikes into enemy armor. I don't really see that unless each of the spikes on the knuckles rotate independently, and I guess the power supply must be stored inside the forearm portion. Spiked gloves are the second and last of the Brotherhood of Steel offerings, and it is extremely simple in principle. It's a glove with spikes. It is an okay weapon in the early game, but it is very quickly outclassed as you progress. Although the description states it can puncture armor, there is no perk or additional effect. And I honestly find the size, number, and placement of the spikes on the glove to be rather absurd. The one on the back of the fist looks particularly dangerous to the user. Likely inspired by the Deathclaw Gauntlet, the Yao Guai Gauntlet is first shown in the Honest Hearts DLC of New Vegas. It is not as powerful as the Deathclaw Gauntlet, but it does have a slightly faster swing speed and slightly higher critical multiplier. The weapon also appears to use a medical brace and belt, just like the Deathclaw Gauntlet. However, it appears to be a glove rather than a true gauntlet that is strapped to the forearm and hand. Similar to the original Deathclaw Gauntlet, this must be cured a bit or taxidermied to make it a usable glove. And the gauntlet itself is unique to the Sorrows tribe. They are the only ones seen with them and they are actually considered a rite of passage for members of the tribe, who are tasked to find and kill Yao Guai, from which they can fashion their own gauntlet. It is shockingly durable at almost 3,000 strikes from max condition, and has a few unique variants. Shi's Embrace is a gauntlet made from the ghost of Shi, which is a large Yao Guai, engulfed in flame, that the player encounters when they do their own rite of passage, after tripping balls on Datura. She's Embrace somehow gets even more durable, as well as a critical damage boost, normal damage boost, critical multiplier boost, and lower AP cost. The character, Waking Cloud, has a unique gauntlet that only she can use, unless you use console commands, and it is on par with the base Yao Guai gauntlet, just with a faster attack speed. Overall, I like the idea of the gauntlet, and integrating it with tribal groups that are found in Zion Canyon. The idea of using animal parts to craft weapons is not a new idea. Some cultures have used shark teeth set in a club or a sword-like object, while Inuit groups have used walrus tusks to craft harpoons. But the Deathclaw and Yao Guai gauntlets are on a whole different level, using the entire hand. Here comes a group of so-called weapons that under any other circumstance would never be considered a weapon. First shown in Old World Blues, the add-on for New Vegas, the Scientist Glove is a rather unassuming item and can be found in a number of places around the Big MT. It was, as the name suggests, worn by scientists as a form of protection while they engaged in their experiments. But it's somehow able to deal 21 damage. The critical damage is rather pitiful at 5, and the critical multiplier is also unimpressive. But the fact that a simple scientific glove can be a decent low to mid-level weapon is kind of insane. The durability is very low, at 245 strikes from full condition. The cool thing about the glove is that there are a bunch of variants. So, 
Let's start with the corrosive glove. This one is green rather than blue and found in either the Z43 toxins plant or dropped by a unique spore plant called Dionea miscapula. It does the same amount of damage as the scientist glove, but does additional acid damage of 10 HP for 10 seconds. Presumably the glove is green because it is coated in this acid and acid damage is superior to poison since it works on living organisms as well as inorganic enemies like robots. The sterilizer glove is red and causes heat damage at 2 HP for 5 seconds upon a successful strike. It is otherwise identical to the scientist glove in stats, although it is a lot more durable and can strike about a thousand times. It can only be found at the Y17 medical facility and on the robo brain called Super Ego, east of Higgs Village. What could cause it to light enemies on fire? Perhaps it is coated in some volatile chemicals that can ignite with just a little bit of kinetic force or friction, similar to a strike anywhere match. The next glove we will look at is the best looking of the lot, being black and bearing a skull, being owned by none other than the dastardly Dr. Mobius. Only one can be found on a table near Mobius and has some rather fun effects. It does higher damage than all previously mentioned gloves, but also lowers the target's energy weapon skill and perception for 30 seconds. Upon a critical hit, it will knock back the target and cause it to frenzy, which can make it quite useful when you're getting ganged up on by multiple enemies. When striking an enemy, a small blue electrical shockwave is given off and the enemy will ragdoll on a critical hit. The frenzy effect can be problematic sometimes when friendly characters get too close, so be careful when you're laying people out in the name of science. My last favorite part of this weapon is the frenzy effect, which is called MADNESS, in all caps and an exclamation mark, which is just the cherry on top of everything else. The last of the many variants is Dr. Klein's glove, which is blue just like the normal scientist glove. With the words Dr. K written on the side, Similar to how Mobius' glove has the madness effect, this one has the science effect. It has the highest damage and critical multiplier of all variants, and the same energy weapons and perception debuff as Mobius' glove. The science effect, however, reduces the strength and damage threshold of an enemy, while the glove itself has middling durability and decent AP cost at 18. It can only be found in Higgs Village, and depending on the situation is either the best of all the gloves or is the second best to Mobius' glove. The last two gloves have probably been modified by their owners rather than being contaminated with some sort of substance like the earlier gloves, and it seems they have somehow been imbued with part of the personality of their own owners as well. Fallout Tactics is back with another weak but cool looking weapon, the Shredders. The description is perhaps the most boring one for any weapon ever and just states, Gloves with short claws built into the fingers. They do look pretty sinister, although good luck using your smartphone with one of those. It does a base damage of 3 to 6 and is otherwise not that remarkable. But one eyebrow raising comment comes from the concept art, which kind of makes it look like a Black Panther glove and describes the glove as sexy black leather gloves with steel claws. Phone it in, I think we found their kink, guys. Fallout New Vegas gives us the last animal-based weapon, the Mantis Gauntlet, which uses the foreleg of an unusually large mantis that are found all over the Mojave, and straps it to the top of the user's arm, requiring a strength of 4 and an unarmed skill of 75, which is surprisingly high. This weapon does 30 damage and has a times 3 critical multiplier, making it pretty okay. Its durability is super low at 245, which can make it difficult to justify using, and this weapon is mainly wielded by white legs in the Honest Hearts DLC. The unique variant, called Embrace of the Mantis King, looks different, being larger and having bumps and spikes down its length with a serrated edge. It has higher damage and critical damage, being balanced by a slower swing speed, but overall the DPS is higher than the base gauntlet. It is a bit more durable than the normal gauntlet and can be found at the Gunrunners or Mick and Ralph's. Rather shockingly, the name does not seem to be a reference to anything, as Josh Sawyer told fans that it was just a name that seemed to fit the 50s sci-fi theme that Old World Blues, which was releasing around the time, really leaned into. Although this is not stated or implied in the lore anywhere, I do like to think that the larger and more powerful mantis that this came from was the legendary mantis, since so many creatures in Fallout New Vegas 
had a single legendary version, but Mantises did not. The legendary Mantis isn't present. There are also only two of these gauntlets, which is the exact number you could make from a single Mantis. Hmm. Fallout 76 has one more gauntlet for the masses, the Mole Miner Gauntlet. Rather than being made out of the remains of some creature, it has an industrial look with two large blades protruding from it. Damage wise it is fairly average and has one mod that adds an extra blade and causes bleeding damage. It honestly reminds me a lot of the Deathclaw Gauntlet with two cutting edges and only one modification which is to add a third blade. They are commonly found on mole miners, shocking, I know, and the plan to craft the weapon can also be found on the mole miners. The design is rather cool and gives the impression that it is fashioned out of industrial materials, something that does make sense with all the mining equipment left around the ash heap for the mole miners to reuse for their own purposes. Fallout New Vegas has the Zap Glove, which is very similar looking to the Displacement Glove, just some small modifications and a different color scheme. Rather than some sort of shockwave producing plate on the knuckles, it has an electrified plate that will spark and upon hitting a target will create its own kind of electrical shockwave. The damage is fairly middling at 30 base damage, but its specialty is against robots and power armored targets, where it does plus 50 damage against robots and plus 20 against power armor. This makes sense given the electrical nature of the attack, just make sure you don't use it against NCR power armor, which is stripped of all the electrical components, so it doesn't have its bonus effect. The unique variant has an awesome name of Paladin Toaster, and looks beefed up and has a different color scheme. It does 6 extra base damage and critical damage, although all other stats seem to be the same as the base weapon. Although it is only a bit better, it is worth it just for the name and look alone, and it is found on the body of a dead prospector in the Black Rock Cave, and it makes me wonder what the story is behind it. It was obviously used against the Brotherhood of Steel as indicated by the name, but how did it end up in the hands of this prospector? Once again, a questionable tactics entry, the Tiger Claws, don't have the blades on the knuckles or the top of the fist, but rather in the palm. This just seems so problematic on so many levels. Again, only doing 4-6 to six base damage, it can be found in several places, usually on raiders' bodies. Again, the concept art mentions the use of black leather. I do not get what the obsession was with specifying black leather in these design documents, and I really question the usefulness of a weapon with multiple blades in the palms. The last entry here is a combination entry from Fallout Tactics and New Vegas, and I wanted to save one of the best for last. The Punch Gun of Tactics is a unique weapon that is fitted with a mega short gun on top of the fist. Consisting of just a firing chamber and a super short barrel, the trigger is tripped by a bar across the knuckles, so that, in theory, it fires when the fist impacts a target. So the target gets punched, and then gets a hole punched through them. It deals a lot more damage, with 10 to 20 base damage, and it uses a 12 gauge shotgun shell when used, which yeah, that'll do the trick. Surprisingly, this isn't hard to come by and can be found on several raiders in the mid to late game. Enter Fallout New Vegas, which takes this concept and makes it the most powerful unarmed weapon in the entire game. Built very similarly to the Zap and Displacer Glove, a plate triggers shotgun shells mounted in the wrist forearm area to fire when punching a target. The shotgun is double barreled as one can obviously see, although it isn't clear if two shells fire at once. It does a whopping 80 base damage, but it requires a strength of 9 and a 100 unarmed skill to use effectively. It also has a swing speed of 1.1 seconds, making it much faster than many other unarmed options. Once again, the ammo is infinite, like previous gloves, and there is a unique variant called Two-Step Goodbye, which is a gun runner's weapon. It changes from a double barreled configuration to a single barrel and has a new yellow color scheme with an explosive hazard symbol on the side, which foreshadows a rather unique ability. The critical hit actually is much lower than the original, but it has a 4 times chance of inducing a critical hit, and if an enemy is killed on a critical hit, a delayed charge detonates in their body, producing area of effect damage that does 175 damage. How does it do this exactly? Who knows, since it only happens with criticals, but we aren't exactly complaining because it can be a really useful effect. 
One funny thing is that you can do stealthy takedowns with it, even though it is literally just a gun with a fancy trigger. Well, brothers and sisters, that is the end of the list, but not the video. If you watched my first video on unarmed weapons, then you have officially heard about every unarmed weapon up to this point. But with Fallout 76 being a game as a service, I doubt it will be long before we get some new ones. On to my comment highlights for my video about why the Brotherhood of Steel is problematic, and my other video on whether Detroit would make a good Fallout location. Before that though, I want to thank these lovely patrons for contributing to Adam's Kingdom on Earth. You all make it possible for me to bring higher quality and higher quantity of videos, and Adam will reward you. On to the comments. On my Brotherhood of Steel video, I got a wide range of comments, where some people agreed with my assessment and others disagreed strongly. That is perfectly fine. The nature of such a video allows us fans with different viewpoints, experiences, and opinions to be able to have a discussion about a series we love. And that right there is the part I'm most interested in. Boise Gang made a comment, which to summarize, they essentially think that it is okay that the Brotherhood is portrayed as hypocritical. And you know what? I absolutely agree. I don't dislike the Brotherhood. They are a very interesting part of the series and lore. And I think that their hypocrisy and contradictions just makes them more realistic. Breaking down a faction to parse what is good and what is bad and why we think so is far more intellectually stimulating than just a monolithic group that is either always good or always bad. I like the fact that the Brotherhood has diversity of thought as well, since the merits of the different philosophies can be contrasted with each other, like comparing the effectiveness of Lyon's governing methods compared to the West Coast Brotherhood, or looking at the factors that contribute to the success and growth of any single chapter. The series as a whole would be less rich without the Brotherhood, and I am glad that they're there. Several of you expressed sentiments similar to Xeonix here that admitted to a preference for the Lion's governing philosophy, so there are actually far more of you than you may realize. I too am glad for this change, and the Steel Rain expansion for Fallout 76 actually does a pretty good job of pitting an ideology based less on the Brotherhood and more on people of the Wasteland against an ideology centered around the Brotherhood first. It makes for intriguing discussion, which I think a lot of us enjoy. A number of you mentioned the Midwest Brotherhood of Steel, like Clea of the Bog here, and there is a good reason for me to not include it in my video. While I do think that the Midwestern Brotherhood of Steel are interesting, particularly where they depart from the normal Brotherhood practices and beliefs. That being said, however, the fact that tactics is not considered canon except for what details are confirmed in main title games made me decide ultimately to exclude it. Similar to how I didn't include information from sources like the Fallout Bible or the Van Buren design documents. Omitting them was a deliberate decision on my part, and I hope you can understand even if you don't necessarily agree. To end on a light note, Six Wing Zombie mentioned that the only power armored group they trust is the Atom Cats. And I have to say, I agree completely, daddy -o. My video on Detroit got a lot of responses and I am proud of all of you that did not disappoint with all the Detroit jokes. What was left of Detroit has now just been obliterated by all of you. The overall response to the video and prospect of it becoming a series of videos was positive. So I will be integrating the series with the other ones that I am currently doing. And the only thing I need from you is to let me know in the comments what the next location would be that you would like to see, and I will tally up the comments. The location with the most comments will get to feature in the next video, and although I haven't yet tallied the results, there seem to be a strong showing for New Orleans, so stay tuned. Tristan Seaver brought up a good point about the sports teams in Detroit. All the different stadiums for each of the teams are all located inside city limits. And this could mean that the stadiums could function as faction headquarters since they would have the space and infrastructure to make for good settlements. Tristan actually made another good comment where he mentioned that most of the highways in Detroit are cut into the ground and speculated about these below ground level highways getting flooded and becoming canals. That is something I hadn't even considered and sounds very interesting. Good ideas, Tristan. Berserker Tank mentioned a facility known as Willow Run that was an important location for World War II bomber construction, which could have been used in the pre-war as manufacturing for the Sino-American War. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. 
I try to do a good amount of research and find places of importance or historical significance, but some do slip through. Mark Rady had an interesting post being from the Upper Peninsula himself, where he suggested that there could be some animosity between the upper and lower portions of the state, since there already kind of exists some in our world. This is something I wasn't really aware of and could absolutely factor into the dynamics of a game centered in and around this area. Dakota Fogarty had a great comment that I should factor in the animals, and I would expand this to just the environment in general when ranking the locations. Great call there, it will definitely be considered in the videos going forward. That is it, oh irradiated ones. We have reached the end of this video. I really value your input and enjoy your comments and interactions. So please, take care of yourselves. Seek Adam's holy glow, and I will see you next week.